Our second reading of scripture this day comes to us from the gospel according to John, John chapter 11, verses 32 to 44, uh, which you can find in the New Testament section on page 105 in your pew Bible. Let us listen now to God's holy word and what it says to us this day. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her were also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the people said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not have opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you? that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Then Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. You know, if there was a story written about us, about humanity, I think it would center on relationships. For we are a relational people who often value deeply the connectional threads that hold us together. But at the same time, this story of all of us would also tell not just of these uplifting moments of our connection, but it would also tell of our losses, it would tell of our fears, it would tell of our waywardness. This week, as many remember saints who have passed this year, We are reminded in our reading for today, for the moments, we look for resurrection here and now. Perhaps if we follow the Spirit of God, we too might discover the dirty work of resurrection. The work of resurrection as one of mourning, of redemption, and rebuilding. It's a rare moment in the gospel story to find Jesus weeping, to find Jesus mourning over the loss of a friend. We see Jesus be passionate, express emotion in several other stories, but this is a special moment where we see just how much Jesus cared for the loss of a dear friend, of a loved one. Jesus wept was a sign of his love for a friend who now lays in a tomb. But it is also a sign and is a sign for us that shows how much our living God cares for us, especially when we find ourselves in tombs of our own making. For as we look for moments of resurrection, we must recognize the moments where we trap ourselves in tombs of our own design, in need of resurrection ourselves. This happens when we surround ourselves with questions of what could have been, what was, how. But those questions can't change our present reality, and more often than not, instead keep us in an endless cycle of fatigue and weariness. 
We also find ourselves in need of resurrection in moments trapped in our own tombs. When perhaps we find ourselves plagued with guilt for all the times we have driven others to their tombs. By our words, by our deeds, by acts intentional and unintentional. That there is important if we talk about what it means for us to be relational, for us to talk about resurrection. Because the sad truth is, us here as people of faith, us in the church, my oh my. My oh my, how often have we driven other people to their tombs by things that we have said, things that we have done things that have not lived into the heart, the promise, the life way of God. When we find that we are in a tomb of our own, when we think that we have done something that is so unforgivable that there is no way out, when we are on the brink of thinking, This is our fate. That is when we hear a voice calling to us from the outside. Hey, you, Gary, or Gail, or Dave, and these are names of people I know, so it's not (laughs) no (laughs) reflection of anyone in particular. You who are a beloved child of God, yes, you come out into the light. Come and feel the warmth of the rays of God's life and love. Come out and risk living again for the sake of love. Come enter into a community of relationship. Jesus stands at the opening of whatever closed-off cave we've made for ourselves and pulls us free from the hold of death and despair. It is that needed jolt to wake us up from a spirit of listlessness to one of new life and invigoration. The resurrection of Lazarus from the damp, dark, entombed was a miraculous sight. It was miraculous for more than one reason, but also that it was not just a solo endeavor. It wasn't done alone. Yes, Jesus stands at the entrance to the tomb and commands Lazarus to come out, but who greets him? His friends, his family, a fellowship of others who gather to bear witness to this miraculous sight. Resurrection as a community endeavor. As Lazarus most likely stumbled out of the tomb, adjusting their eyes, perhaps through the bright rays coming through the cloth, the community sweeps in, swoops in to untie the bandages wrapped around his body. Cleanse it from the musty smell that must have clung to him from his time in the grave. The moment of resurrection, the moment of new life required action and vision, not just of Jesus, but of those around Lazarus, the community. Jesus' role was indeed significant, but without the involvement of others, I think the power of the biblical narrative is somehow missing something. Resurrection is is dirty work, but it is work, my friends, that is holy, part of our identity as people created in God's image. As we look at the relational aspects of this passage, there are two things, there are a couple things I want you to consider and take to heart. The first is that Jesus continues to stand at the entrance of whatever tomb you might find yourself in at this time and calls out to you by name. 
If you are wrestling with fear, of doubt, of uncertainty, if you are perhaps struggling how to live in community you find difficult because of the people you are surrounded by, listen and listen closely. Pray and listen to the voice of God who weeps for us, for all, and desires to bring us to life anew. Do not forget that it is this living God who, though may feel distant at times, is walking by your side through the pains and glory of life. The second thing is this, is don't stop building relationships, either in your individual lives or as people who belong to this community of faith. I know that periods of transition are complicated. Things slip through the cracks. Patience begins to wane, tempers flare. But Jesus' calling to you is to be that community of people who rushes in to do the work of resurrection. To rush in and be the people who unbind those who are bound by the grips of death despair. And that call does not stop. The relationships you formed will continue to form and bear witness to the resurrection hope, resurrection love that is made manifest today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. And that sacred calling does not stop because we find ourselves in periods or seasons of change. So please, Continue to build relationships that undo bindings and help bring people into the light. The deep relationships Jesus calls us to care about involve taking risks. It involves personal investments and a daring to see the world through new eyes, which we can't do from a darkened tomb. The challenge for us this season will be to listen hard for the voice of Jesus calling out to us, to reinvigorate our sense of identity and purpose and mission. Of course, we are not the first people who've had to wrestle with this question. Lord knows that generations before us have also struggled with similar endeavors and feelings. But as they learned new ways to lean hard into the vision that God was casting for them, may we too learn to lean hard into the promises of God. Lean hard into the ways where the Spirit of God is calling us to act. As we remember how much God values and cherishes a relationship with us, may we give thanks. And in offering thanks, take the following steps to be a part of something that helps us and others find their way out of the darkness. May we live our lives together. And friends, may we joyfully participate in the dirty work of resurrection. I want you to continue uh, meditating on this passage, and uh, I've gotten a little better at letting Joanna know ahead of time of what kind of song I'm pairing it with. So I just invite you to continue uh, having a moment of reflection on this passage. us together within your love. Bind us together within your holy love. As we share in our sorrows, we will share in your joy. Bind us together in love. Bind us 
together and be our peace. Bind us together and be our perfect peace. Though the tempest may rage, we will rest in your joy. Bind us together in peace. Bind us together and give us hope. Bind us together and give us endless hope. Though our tears were our bread, we will feast in your joy. Bind us together in hope. Bind us together and make us one. Bind us together and make us true. Be one in your love, in your peace, in your hope, in your joy. Bind us together as one in your hope, in your peace, in your hope, in your joy. Bind us together as one.